Welcome to the Black Creator Series, brought to you by Candlewick Press in collaboration with Red Clay Educators, hosted by Dr. Sonia Cherry Paul, bringing dynamic books, authors, illustrators, and artists to your classroom and to the world. Look for episodes of the Black Creator Series on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Our guest creator this episode is British Nigerian author Shade Lapite, who drew on her own heritage to create the world of her debut novel, The Goddess Crown, a thrilling Afro fantasy set in the lush, opulent kingdom of Gala. Here's your host, New York Times bestselling author Dr. Sonia Cherry Paul, founder of Red Clay Educators and co founder of the Institute for Racial Equity in Literacy. Welcome to the Black Creator Series. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me, Dr. Sonia. So, wondered if you we could start off talking about when and how did you fall in love with fantasy as a genre of reading? Were there titles that you read in school that just stayed with you? Who are some of the writers of fantasy today that you're drawn to and you really admire? Let's talk about this genre that uh, you are uh, a fan of. I really enjoy fantasy. I feel like um, just, you know, from primary school, I used to enjoy reading about sort of, you know, kings and queens and castles and uh, swashbuckling stories, all that kind of thing. Um, when I started secondary school, I had a favorite author, Tamora Pierce, who writes um, sort of fantasy stories set in like a sort of, I don't know, the 18th century England um, as just as, in terms of the location. I feel like she's been my favorite writer all the way up into adulthood I still have her books I still go back to them mm-hmm. um and I feel like she she kind of guides a lot of the way that I write um fantasy um I also love Diane Wynne Jones um who wrote like Howl's Moving Castle I love those stories and just the way that she creates a world um so yeah so and I continue to enjoy um fantasy now I've just read um Iron Widow by Shiran J Chow and that book is just amazing like Mm. it it just the her world building the characters and everything the pace of it is fantastic I'm reading um Babel right now which again a fantasy and it's just what you can do in terms of talking about the real world while using sort of allegory and analogies and you know it's quite you can you can push things quite far while still in a fantastical world which I really enjoy yeah You know, I once heard the children's author Grace Lynn um, say in a presentation that as a child, she always loved fantasy, but couldn't help but notice that even in a genre where anything could happen, she still did not exist. She did not see herself reflected in any of the books that she read. And I wondered, what are your noticings about racial and cultural representation in fantasy books for young readers? That's definitely something that you can't get past. I mean, I think that now it's so much better than it was. But I guess when I was reading fantasy as a child, as a teen, there were no Black people in those books at all. You just didn't exist. But um, I guess I felt like at the time it was so complete that you didn't expect to find yourself in there. You just, you you were never looking for yourself. So you didn't know that you could be in those books. Um, so yeah, just the absence of it is, is really striking. But I guess, I mean, now I feel like there's still, there's a lot of books now with, I think, female, Black female heroines in them. But I still feel like for Black boys reading, um, it's, if both you know sort of middle school and um secondary school they don't find themselves in those books and I really noticed that when I go to look for um fantasy for um for my nephews and for the kids of friends I'm like wow where are these books and what a shame to not just have them not exist yeah and I think that issue exists across the board starting in elementary school with early readers. It's very challenging to find incredible literature where that where black characters are really at the center of their own story. Let's talk about Goddess Crown. Um this is an Afro fantasy novel. 
And I got to tell you, Afro fantasy was not accessible to me as a young reader in any of my classrooms, in the curriculum, in the school library, as we were just saying, you know, those books were, were missing. And I think what, I can't help but think about what reading this genre would have done for me as a young person. To the, the escapism it would have provided me as a reader to be wrapped up in worlds and languages and experiences so very different from my own, seeing Black characters at the center of their own stories in powerful ways, not as victims or sidekicks existing solely to serve the needs of, of the white main character. And I also feel Afro fantasy serves as a bridge to uh, the possibilities of learning about African civilizations, cultures, languages, landscapes, histories that are typically omitted from curriculum. So how would you describe Afro fantasy and why do you believe it's so important for all children, um, but specifically Black children, to have access to this genre? I feel like you summed it up so well. Like it's um, there was a, a study done, and I feel like they've actually done it a few years in the UK in terms of, you know, they looked at the kinds of books that Black characters or characters of colour appeared in, and they discovered that, you know, Characters of colour were only in something like 4% of the books that were available to children. And then within that, um, there was there was it was mostly so social justice stories. So um, things about, you know, becoming a refugee or dealing with um, sort of social issues, maybe poverty or, you know, racism. And it was so there, there were it was stories with a message in some ways right um but they weren't in you know fantasy or anything that kind of it, that was escapist that sort of took you mm -hmm. away from the world and I think that that's you know it's such a shame for for you know for children of color because it does you know it puts you in um, those children into sort of different situations where you can imagine yourself as something else something outside of you know the world that you that you live in and expands the possibilities and the parameters of the world that you live in but also for all children because again it just shows the breadth of anybody can be anything and it, it makes it all seem possible so you know the lack of that is is huge and now I mean I think it's changing in terms of teen books but I still think younger books it's not changing you know as much or as quickly so you know I feel like that that is a huge thing so when I was writing Goddess Crown the first draft of it you know it was a story that was kind of based on um the idea of Elizabeth I as somebody who is um, the child of a king who um, who has who, who has had the, his wife the queen executed for reasons and right. now you know it, she's going dis to discover whether she can become you know um, the next ruler. So the the first draft of it, the first many drafts actually were she was a white character in a white world because I it didn't even occur to me that I could make her black I'd never mm -hmm. seen a black character in a fantasy world like that and I didn't know how to approach it at all and the point at which I thought oh I could I could make her black like mm -hmm. it was like quite revelatory and I was like oh okay well then what happens to her world and and I'm like well who are the people around her who are her family and where have they come from and where where are they so having to, to tackle all of those questions I really had to think about you know in the end it just made sense to actually put her in a black world because I thought how is a black person becoming queen in a white world like it doesn't make sense so then once I put her in a black world I thought right I've got to build this world out now what does it look like and um, and then I realized that I just knew, you know, I thought, well, it makes sense to just borrow from African history. But I realized you don't know any African history because you haven't learned any in school. Right. Mm -hmm. And you'd never even though I grew up with parents who, you know, were born and raised in Nigeria, it had never we hadn't really had those conversations. And so I didn't, you know, and even then they grew up in, you know, the 40s and 50s during colonialism when Nigeria was colonized by Britain so even their understanding or that their the, the Nigeria they had grown up in had been not you know it was still very influenced by England so when I wanted to build the world I thought I'm going to go back pre-slavery pre-colonialism yeah. right what was 
there before like what was the government like what were religions like what were you know buildings like and architecture and what was farming like and what was trade like and all of that kind of thing and it was just this huge discovery and it was a lot of fun to pick and choose what parts of that world that I discovered that I could then feed into the book and you know, it was a lot of fun for me to write. And I hope it's a lot of fun for people to read because it is, it does feel so new because it's just not out there, you know, easily accessible. Yeah. And in the United States, you know, I often get a question from teachers who, you know, they're like, I I need to teach about enslavement. And I'm worried about how my black students are going to feel. And I'm like, well, if the first time you were talking about blackness, is through the lens of oppression and victimization and trauma, then yeah, they're gonna feel pretty bad in that classroom. But what we need to do is make sure that all children, particularly black children understand that um, black history and black people do not begin with slavery. And so it doesn't mean that you as a teacher have to go back and get another degree in African, you know, history, but it does mean that you should be curious enough to do the kinds of things that you you've just done to, to read about African civilizations, to learn about African icons and to bring that learning into the classroom in meaningful, powerful ways so that when you do get to the unit or the work of talking about um, struggle and trauma and victimization. Every child in that classroom, particularly black children know first black people were free and black people were, you know, kings and queens and inventors and right, all of those things. And it what it, that does is it fortifies young learners and protects them and builds their self sense of self, right? And I think that, you know, Afro fantasy, although I did not have access to that, and I didn't have access to the actual kind of learning I'm describing, what Afro fantasy does is it is this possibility, right? It makes this possibility um, for these kinds of things to happen in, in classrooms. I hope teachers will add this book, God is Crown, um, to, to their curriculum and into their text sets. And I just have to shout out the art on the cover. I mean, my goodness, my goodness. Right. The illustrator did a beautiful job, right? Just It is absolutely stunning. You cannot walk past this. Uh, I have an adult daughter who happens to be uh, home this weekend. And I, she said, what is that? <laughs> right? She's like, what is this? And that is what this cover is giving. You can't walk past this. You can't deny the yeah. everything that you see right here. Rebel, queen, right? The, the I don't know, just the well, power the opulence, radiating. Right. Yeah. right, the opulence, just radiating from her. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about this novel, right? I savored every word of this, every image you've created of the characters, their lives and the world around them. How did this story come to you as a writer? In in the about the author section um, in the book, it shares that you've drawn on your British Nigerian heritage to create the world of this novel. Will you share a little bit more about that and how this story came to you as a writer um, I would love to to make that connection. Absolutely. Well, I guess, it, I mean, it really is just reflects the fact that the British Nigerian mix, right? Because as I said, the story was, you know, I wrote it for like a writing challenge and it, it, the premise that I used um, as a foundation was the story of, you know, Elizabeth I. So, you know, English history. But then in terms of, you know, building the world that she comes from, then I thought, you know, I'll go back to, you know, trips that I, my family had made to Nigeria to like my grandparents' village. And just, you know, so I thought of, you know, the red dust of a city like Abekuta, um, where my father's family comes from. And it, it's, it's, it's you know so hot the sun beats down and the, the the red sand is everywhere and the houses are sort of you know baked brick and there's all you know there's a whole range of different types of architecture there but um I thought about like you know in terms of what the clothing that she wears like this 
the gilly that she has on her head yeah. my um you know my mother never goes to a social function without tying her head tie and she's got them in a whole array of colors and different fabrics and it always matches the outfit and the shoes yeah. and the bag and you know the way you look is so important in sort of in Nigeria and in Yoruba culture and I wanted to infuse that into the world that she lives in and then also again just about the um you know about that world building that as I was discovering things so you know like they live in sort of baked clay um houses and it's the kind of thing where when you're in school, somebody might say, well, you know, Africans, you all live in, you know, mud huts kind of thing. And it's like, there's, you're in a tropical country. It makes sense to live in a house that's made from this material because it actually, you know, works like a thermostat in, in that climate. Like there's reasons why things are made from different materials and it makes sense to that place. So, you know, I hope that for, you know, for children reading, I try to put those things in like a, in, in a very seamless, gentle way, but, you know, so that you don't feel like you've got to defend yourself in, in, in terms of no Africans don't. Yes, we do do that. And it makes perfect yeah. sense for where we come from. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so I think, you know, the food, um, just the different, you know, types of like, you know, ground cassava and the different types of um, um, soups and spices. I wanted that richness of the world that I had kind of grown up in and the world that I'd visited when we would go to Nigeria. I wanted to infuse all of that into the book as much as possible. And you have, because there is the story about Kalothia. Am I pronouncing her name correctly, the character? I say Calathea, but everybody can Calathea. say Calathea. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's a story about Calathea and, you know, where she comes from and, 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 and what happens, right? There's the, you know, above the, the, the ground plot. And then there is the deeper meaning, right? The, the way in which you, you know, um, show the lives of people who's, you know, who are so easily misrepresented, Right. Um, and there's just so much to love ab about this character, starting with Calothea, the protagonist, who is essentially searching to learn more about herself, her background, her family, her identity. And I see her and all the ways sh she desires to be connected to this as not only the struggle of this character, but as a like a metaphor for many Black people, particularly in the United States, who, because of chattel slavery, have been torn from their cultural roots and struggle to return to them, even as we acknowledge and honor our connection to Africa. So this book is a bomb for every Black reader who has that yearning. I'm not sure if I have a particular question about any of this, <laughs> but I just wanted to say that I see myself in Calathea which goes back to our initial conversation about the importance of representation, right? Yeah. Um, my grand adventure in 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 my in my life may not include fighting off enemies and traveling long distances incognito, but I too am searching and battling against erasure and battling for knowledge and working to continue to know myself and my blackness and um, remaining in the struggle for equality and liberation. So thank you for this story and for this incredible character. Um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about her and, uh, you know, is she based on anyone in your life or uh, where does she come from? Yeah. I think Thank you for that. I feel like, you know, I, I hope and the aim was to make her story sort of very universal. And I think that a lot of us go through the same struggles. So like you said, even though we're not battling off sort of mercenaries and things, it's that kind of that journey of trying to find what your place in the world is, what you're capable of doing and living up to your, you know, your, your potential. And I feel, feel like her journey from, you know, sort of this very secluded um, the place where she grows up to the, the royal court and then being like, right, I've got to step up my game and what, what, what am I capable of? And am I going to allow people to define me and put the barriers in my way kind of thing. And I felt like I had to talk about sort of sexism because I felt like as soon as for women, we're always having to um, prove ourselves and no matter how accomplished or you know how educated or whatever you are as soon as you're sort of in a room with men then then it then it's put, brought into question and then you've got to you, you know she's literally got to um 
undergo these challenges to prove that she you know that she is capable so I wanted you know I wanted her to have a a think to be put in those situations but I also wanted her to consider what she wanted what she wanted for herself like so much of her life had been sort of other people dictating to her and you know she's when she's in the royal court there's just this kind of feeling of well this is an opportunity where you can help women um you know in, in the, you can help improve their civil rights and you know you could change the structure of this country and I wanted her to have a moment where she thought about, do I want to do that? Because I wanted her to have a choice over that because activism can be draining and it's tiring and it takes a toll on you. And so, and I think women are kind of forced to do it because we're constantly fighting sexism and black people do it because we're fighting racism. And it does, you know, that whole, you know, the, the quote about, how racism just it, it detracts it distracts you from other things that you want to achieve so I wanted her to have a think about well, what else do I want to do in my life and mm. to, to make a conscious choice about okay you know whether I'm gonna lead the struggle kind of thing so um I just I think you know that again I sort of wrote the first draft of this novel. It was just going to be a thing. It was just a challenge. I was going to put it away somewhere. And it kept on coming back to me year after year. Mm -hmm. And I kept on fiddling with it so much because of Calathea and just being so drawn to her character and finding her so fascinating and um, just so bold and so daring. And that, you know, she would just was relentless about the things that she wanted to achieve. But she was also compassionate and loving um, and very loyal. And I think that I feel like she's a lot like makes me think of my mother who is very no nonsense will yeah. get things done will look gorgeous while she's doing it but will <laughs> absolutely shower you with love at the first at the same time and be able to do all of those things together and, I, and yeah I just wanted to encapsulate all of those things in one character. I want to also talk about the goddess right in 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 goddess crown I mean she is everything and in one part of the story, she tells Colothea, I didn't mean for women to be lesser. If you take the throne, Gala will see that they're not. You'll raise them up to be equal. And so you were talking about, um, you know, just girls having an, the space to think about uh, who they want to be in the world, um, what they want to fight for. And also to be protective of themselves from giving too much of themselves in the fight. Um, and it made me think about, you know, or or wonder, what do you want girls, particularly Black girls who are reading Goddess Crown, who navigate these intersections and marginalizations of both race and gender, what do you want them to learn from the goddess and from Colothea? Mm. Oh gosh, that's a good question. Mm. Because I mean, the goddess, the goddess is a tr it, it, an interesting character because I feel like she is another person who is sort of trying to maneuver Calathea in certain ways. Um, but, and, and you sort of think, well, why can't you just fix this? I mean, you created this world, right? And I wanted to say something about religion in terms of just, you know, you can believe in, in, a, in a higher power and, but you can still have questions about, well, why can't, why is it like this? Um, and and get ne not necessarily any answers back, just, you know, reasons, right? That's why. Um, but so, yeah, the, the, the goddess is sort of very focused on wanting to improve this world and wanting, you know, women to or girls to sort of to, to rise up and to help in that cause. Um, for Calathea, I feel like, oh, let me make sure I haven't forgotten the question. So it's, um, what do I want girls to take away? I, I mean, that, I, I want them to think about, again, having a choice that you don't have to be aware when people are trying to maneuver you and guide you into certain things. And, you know, you can you can step back and you can have a have a think about it. I feel like Calathea is quite good at making space for herself. She's good at forming relationships with with people. You know, she gets to know Bookie and they, you know, have a good friendship. Um, she has like her own personal interests as well. Um, but, you know, she likes to do her like sword fighting. She has her, um, she kind of works out, you know, in the mornings and in the evenings and that kind of thing. She takes time for herself, but she's also like, there's a greater struggle out there and um, I can get stuck into that too. So I like that she is 
again not given a hundred percent like she realizes she you can't you can't pour out if you've got nothing in there right so she takes time for herself as well and I and I would love for girls to read it and just be like you know I can be a multiplicity of things but also you know and I can I can take time to think about what I want to be but also take time to it's nice to do nice things for yourself as well and to, and to think about your own happiness and the things that make you happy and to lean into the things that make you happy and I like that Nahir is there on her journey with her and you know she tells him when she needs her space and then you know when she's available to him kind of thing so he's just another something else that's just she allows him to be a support for her and I like that he's got her back and again it's good to have like sort of an army behind you yeah that's so beautiful and powerful what an important lesson for young girls particularly young black girls to learn um from this book from these two characters um in a world where adultification, right, the statistics on adultification, this idea that young girls, young Black girls have to behave, you know, older than what they really are and just be more mature and, and not allowed to explore uh, and tap into their own joy. Um, I love that one of the things you're hoping is that girls will consider the ways they can be a multiplicity and can lean into their own happiness. That That's really beautiful. So what's next for you? Will we hear more from any of these characters? Are there any other projects you're working about that you can talk about now? <laughs> Well, I am I'm working on another book that is set in the same world, not necessarily the same characters, but some there will be cameos from from some characters in there because I really enjoy the world of Gala. So it'd be nice to explore that further. So I think that's the main project that I'm working on at the moment. But I've also got I've got lots of ideas. And again, I feel like that just the, the the research for this book really made me think about there's so much more you can do with sort of African history and African settings and that kind of thing and open up the floodgates or tons of ideas that I'm looking forward to playing with. That's super exciting and we can't wait for more. So Sade, in Goddess Crown, you show Black girls and Black women as they truly are, full complex, dynamic, fierce, and deserving of love and joy and protection. This story, I think, will for Black, will, will help Black girls to develop a, a strong sense of self and push against the power structures that threaten to break their spirits. By escaping into this world, they discover the powers within themselves to navigate the world they exist in. What does it mean to you to be a Black creator? It, oh gosh, you know, I feel like it's powerful and it's exciting um, because I feel like so much of the world that we live in is actually built on narratives that just have been there that predate us. And it takes you a while to realize that, okay, the reason why the West is thought of in a certain way is because certain narratives have been laid down and we just kind of get used to them. We learn them in schools about sort of a hierarchy, um, you know, in the world. And the reason why men are thought of in a certain way is it's all these narratives um, that underlie everything. And I, I just think that I really want to bring to the forefront the stories from Africa and the stories of African people because I feel like they are out there but they're quite buried and it could be a bit hard to find especially when it comes to history it, it's sort of locked away in academia and I want it to be out there I want children to have you know picture books in front of them I want it to be songs I want there to be cartoons I want you know daytime tv like you know I'm just like I feel like it's quite powerful that I have the skill set that I that I have because I got this interest in African history and African culture. And I have a skill set that allows me to draw it out and turn it into story, which is so easy to share with the world. And luckily, we're living in a time where, you know, things are digital and you can reach people anywhere on the planet. So to be a black creator, I feel like means to, to kind of be a conduit for the stories that, I've, that have not been in the mainstream. Let's get them out there and make sure that, you know, especially all the black kids can see them because there's so much power in that to knowing where you came from. Thank you, Sade. It's been a pleasure to talk with you.
Thank you so much, you too. Thanks for checking out this episode of the Black Creators Series, a Candlewick Press and Red Clay Educators collaboration. Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the notifications button so you won't miss an episode. For more information about the Black Creator Series, go to blackcreatorseries.candlewick.com or soniacherrypaul.com or go to redclayed on Twitter and Instagram.